Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. Uh, today our show will uh, be about Fitness Training 101. And I'm gearing this as a broad discussion about uh, the things that I deem as a professional trainer as well as a owner of a health food store to know uh, particular things that can aid people in fitness training of all walks of life, all fitness levels. So here we go. Um, first of all, diet and nutrition. Huh. Whenever you start a fitness type of training program, you really would like to have in conjunction with it a change in diet modification. And the diets that seem to work the best that I found as a trainer are diets that have good levels of protein, adequate amounts of good fats, and lots of fruits and, fruits and vegetables. Uh, watching your sugar levels, keeping those down and under control, aids with weight loss as well as remember from our, our prior shows that the increase in sugar can increase inflammation uh, as well as the inability to build muscle for those people who are looking for strength or bodybuilding. Um, enzyme rich diets such as uh, your fruits and vegetables, um, raw fruits and vegetables are the best. Uh, ways to go um, and the government tells us we need three to five servings of veggies a day and about the same on fruit obviously if you're diabetic you have to be mindful that you can't do that uh, much fruit but those enzyme rich foods help us to repair they help give us energy they change the pH in our bloodstream making us more alkali uh, therefore, we heal faster, we feel better, and our energy levels rise. Whenever we get too much sugar or junk in our diet, especially when we're fitness training, our energy levels drop, our inflammation rises. So whenever you have anything in which you're, you're training and you have uh, uh, inflammation, you really want to alkali the diet as much as you possibly can with those fruits and vegetables. And you can go on the computer and simply type in alkaline foods and search that, and, and you can get a list of all those uh, types of foods that are alkaline producing and enzyme rich as well. Um, as a trainer, I usually recommend before uh, people start a fitness program or while they're starting a fitness program to go through a cleanse. And that means a bowel and organ type of cleanse. And you, and you can get the kits and, and they range anywhere from about $25 on up to $70 uh, depending on how uh, complete and I've seen it be even higher price than that. But what you do is when you cleanse out the body, you get rid of the gunk, uh, things that have stored in the bowel, you get the liver starting to move better. Uh, you just move things out and get to where the bowels become more regular. Uh, increasing uh, the fibers or certain types of cleansing herbs, lots of good fresh water. What you're basically doing is you're giving your body a good spring clinging so that it will function better. And that means whether you have arthritis, whether or not you have diabetes, or just a healthy overall person, when you cleanse the body, it works better, bottom line. Um, when we're talking about supplements, I get a lot of questions when I'm in the store about uh, the types of supplements you should take when you're fitness training. And besides cleansing out the body and getting it prepared for your, your fitness program, <clears throat> there's the top four things that I usually recommend to people who come in who are saying, I want to get fit again, I want to have endurance, uh, those types of things. The, the a little old lady who's sitting in the chair requires 50 to 60 grams of protein just to maintain uh, a muscle mass of 150 pounds. So most of our population, or a great deal of our population, is very protein deficient. And I'm not talking about that big platter full of steak at the end of the day. I'm talking about consistent protein breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And then if you're um, training to, to build muscle, uh, the standard acceptable um, method is about one gram of protein per, bound, uh, per pound of body weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you need 200 grams of protein, which the body can only use about 40, 45 grams of protein at a time. So you have to have these small meals of protein throughout the day. So in order to maintain muscle, tone muscle, or build muscle, you require additional amounts of protein. Um, the most biologically available or best proteins are going to be uh, whey proteins, egg source proteins, um, there's hemp proteins, rice proteins. Um, believe it or not, that good old platter full of steak has only got a biological availability of about 30 to 35 grams of protein. 
And so you've got all this spillover of protein into the kidneys, so it's very hard, it raises ammonia levels, and it's very hard on the, on the kidneys. So slamming high amounts of meat proteins can cause a lot of inflammation and ammonia, whereas more biologically available proteins like your whey, eggs, soy, hemp, cause a lot less of that spillover. Um, number two, a good multiple vitamin, and I mean a good one one that gets good rankings, um, not something that's uh, compressed for a seven-year shelf life. We want something that has a very good amount of vitamin Bs. Uh, when the body's working out or it's starting a fitness training program, it utilizes Bs and needs Bs in order to synthesize protein. So a good quality multivitamin mineral supplement, I think, is, is uh, important in starting any fitness training program. Whether you're just starting to go on the treadmill or you're starting to do actually heavy weightlifting that you haven't done for 25 years since football. So, um, number three on the list, and, and per, this particular is really, really important, actually in all age categories, but primarily in people who haven't worked out and they're starting to you know, see the little pooch and that type of thing in, from your 30s on upward. When we start to go back to work out again, um, we'll notice sometimes that we get a lot more inflamed than we did when we were out playing soccer when we were 16 or 17 years old. So those essential fatty acids really, really reduce the inflammation in the joints, and those are found in your nuts, uh, flax oil, uh, fish oils particularly have a wonderful way of reducing inflammation. And for arthritic patients who are wanting to work out and keep their mobility and their stiffness away, the fish oils really, really do help with lubrication of the joints and reducing the inflammation in the joints. In addition, they also, as we've discussed further, uh, before, reduce inflammation in the vascular system, the heart, good for the brain, so on and so forth. If you are a endurance athlete or you're uh, in the gym five days a week, you're hitting it very hard, and you notice you just don't have the endurance uh, that you need, uh, there's a supplement called creatine. Um, preferably, uh, you would like to obtain a pharmaceutical grade made in the USA or European source of creatine, good quality uh, lead-free types of, of creatines. What creatine does it, is it goes into uh, the cells of the body and it pulls in water, which increases in ATP or, or, or the energy cycle within muscle tissues. So it gives you stronger, better endurance. It can also increase oxygen utilization for those people who are like marathon runners or people who like to take the long walks around the mission here in, in, uh, in Lompoc. Um, but Mind you, if you're only working out two or three days a week, it's probably not something you need. But if you're really hitting it intensely and hard, creatine be, can be very helpful. For those people who play contact sports like football, soccer, basketball, I've seen heads bang, um, creatine, since it fills the cells with water, also can lessen the chances substantially of concussions. So when I hear these coaches say, oh, no, no creatine, you know. No, if you're giving a good pharmaceutical grade creatine, it lessens the chances of concussions. So I kind of think if you have a, a child, for example, that's extremely in those, uh, in those extreme types of sports of contact, uh, creatine would be something that I would suggest uh, as well. Um, as we mentioned in our, our cleansing portion, uh, keeping the fiber high in the diet, um, our liver and our body uh, secretes hormones, certain amounts of hormones, and then it, it dumps them into the bowel to be evacuated. You know, it's supposed to, to get rid of them. Well, the problem is, is if you're not having that two to three bowel movements a day to get rid of those excessive hormones uh, that the body no longer needs, or the toxins that the body tried to get rid of, you reabsorb them all over again and they get processed through the liver, through everything all over. So it's real important to keep fibers high, um, particularly uh, uh, water-soluble fibers, which would be like your oat brands, uh, apple pectin, grapefruit pectin, your fruit and fiber, uh, excuse me, your fruit and vegetable types of proteins are water-soluble fibers. Um, green tea. Uh, a lot of people say, green tea for working out? Well, green tea also increases oxygen utilization uh, significantly. In addition, it helps 
as an antioxidant. Uh, when we do tend to work out, sometimes we'll release more obviously oxidative processes and that helps neutralize some of those what's called free radicals or that rusting of the vascular or other por portions uh, on a cellular level of the body. Um, Green tea also uh, can be utilized in endurance uh, athletics since it does uh, increase oxygen utilization as well. And recent research shows how much longer, I, I think the study was on five cups of green tea a day, was lengthening life uh, by years. So from a standpoint of an overall good antioxidant and oxygen utilization, green tea can be very, very helpful. Vitamin C. Um, I have a lot of uh, athletes um, coming in or older people who are starting the treadmill program and they all have more issues with joints. And be besides uh, the fish oil types of things, I really suggest that they keep their vitamin C levels up. This really helps with the collagen matrix uh, in the joints. Um, collagen is necessary to maintain the vascular flexibility um, of blood vessels um, and everything else in the body that requires collagen. So it can help uh, with uh, some of the tendon and ligament around the joints, anything that's uh, collagen based, the C can help. In addition, it helps the liver better process um, uh, toxins as well and move things out. Because as you start to exercise, the body starts to move things out. You know, you're jumping and moving, you're, you know, your lymphatic system starts to move again, everything starts to move again like you woke it up. You're not sitting on the couch anymore, all of a sudden you're waking it up. And the body, which is a phenomenal, wonderful machine, will respond if it's given the right nutrients and right care. Um, enzymes. Um, Enzyme-rich foods um, are, as I mentioned before, are very, very important for cellular repair digestion. If you're eating uh, enzyme-rich foods, you'll keep those enzyme uh, levels up. If you're not as good about keeping raw fruits and vegetables, then you can add in digestive enzymes, plant enzymes, uh, pancreatic enzymes. There's, there's a full gamut, but most of them are plant-based types of enzymes that can increase uh, cellular repair and digestion flow. Um, Branch chain amino acids, and I have physicians uh, put patients who are muscle wasting on branch chain amino acids. Branch chain amino acids spare muscle tissue. Um, you take them between meals and what they do then is they keep the muscle from being eaten away as a fuel source. So when an endurance athlete is out running that, that marathon or running his two and three miles or you're walking that mission for two or three miles, branch chain amino acids um, will help prevent the body from using its muscle as its fuel source. So utilizing that as an option in a good dosage, anywhere from, I would say, between two and five grams of branched chain amino acids can be very, very helpful for preventing that muscle eating up. Um, acetyl L-carnitine. Very anti-aging. There's a lot of research on acetyl L-carnitine as far as anti-Alzheimer's. From a athletic standpoint or a fitness training uh, standpoint, it helps in the uh, utilization, as, I, as I've noted down here, for oxygen starvation. So as you're sitting there in your past and you've had that cigarette in your mouth and you just don't oxygenate very well, acetyl L-carnitine will help with oxygen starvation on a cellular level as well. So excellent for those people who also have uh, uh, COPD, which is a, a a breathing type of circulatory disorder as well. Glutamine. Um, a lot of people who want to work out obviously um, want to do it in order to drop weight uh, in addition to getting physically fit and feeling better. Glutamine or L-glutamine helps uh, with sugar cravings. It also helps in uti utilization of uh, protein synthesis. Uh, you'll enhance or it enhances protein synthesis. Um, L-glutamine is also used, um, I know we have uh, one oncologist in particular who recommends taking L-glutamine during chemotherapy treatments because it's extremely healing and protective um, on the uh, digestive tract, the, uh, the small intestines. So helpful to take, must be taken on an empty stomach just like acetyl L-carnitine and they can be taken together before a workout. Citrulline uh, reduces ammonia 
as well as increases energy and vasodilation. Ammonia buildup is with increasing proteins, and particularly if the quality of the proteins aren't as good, citrulline helps reduce ammonia buildup. And sometimes you'll notice um, people when you walk by them, they have this kind of ammonia smell from workout or, or even walking by them. Um, the citrulline can help reduce uh, ammonia production. And then of course, once again, making sure your proteins are good quality proteins also decreases ammonia production. Arnica Montana. This is something I know I personally take before my workouts and then if I hurt myself, muscle strains, muscle fatigue. Arnica Montana is also used by plastic surgeons uh, or recommended uh, by plastic surgeons for their patients before they go into uh, particularly um, plastic surgery on the face or uh, breast augmentation. It helps prevent swelling, um, muscle fatigue, muscle soreness. It's a homeopathic medicine that's been around a long, long time. Uh, you take it under the tongue, it melts. Uh, there are also Arnica Montana creams that can help um, with that muscle soreness that you might get initially when you first start a wor workout program. Um, I hope this uh, helps uh, with some basic information for starting a fitness program. We'll be moving on to our next segment um, with a discussion on different types of options for fitness training. Today on the uh, fitness uh, portion of the show, we'll be discussing various types of equipment that you can utilize in your fitness training program as options. But once again, I always remind you, please consult with your physician and then use common sense when using these types of what I call tools in exercise. Um, there's lots of choices in, uh, depending on your various fitness level or on your um, uh, disabilities that you might have, be it arthritis, uh, there's uh, lots of options available to you. Um, one option that I see utilized a lot uh, in the gym, particularly for, for seniors or those people who tend to have uh, balance issues or who haven't worked out in a long time, is utilization of the ball. Um, there are books, guides, this is just one of many, um, that you can get and you can actually buy the ball uh, to utilize to learn these exercises and then practice the ones that feel the best. You can use it for uh, fitness training or you can use it for uh, uh, strength training, uh, all varieties in that regard. Um, there are exercise bands which are inexpensive and available. You can get them at any good uh, sporting goods store. And what they are basically, they're resistance bands. And you can use them for strength training, uh, uh, resistance training, basically bottom line, in different forms for biceps, for your shoulders. They're convenient. These can travel with you. If you take a nice vacation, they go right into the suitcase. And there are videotapes and, and other uh, media forms, even uh, going on, uh, on the computer, you can get different uh, uh, programs uh, that all the uh, gurus of exercise bands have come out with. Um, simple resistance, uh, good old-fashioned uh, resistance exercises utilizing your own body sources and there are books that you can get on that. Like for example for biceps, you can resist with your own strength and work your biceps. You can resist with your own strength and work your shoulders. Then there are the options, of course, of the gyms. Uh, we have a lot of local gyms uh, that have various personal trainers that can work through programs with you that can make them very, very specific for whatever your needs are. Um, but once again, consider what your various disabilities are, what your fitness level is, and go from there and make sure it is fun. Last comment. Surround yourself with those people who have the same ideals about being fit as you and you'll have a much easier time in staying fit and a much easier time with having a lot of fun in doing what you're doing in your fitness training. So find a buddy if you can, go to the gym, whatever you can do to get somebody that walks that same talk you're walking and that'll help you a lot. Hi, 
welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Turciano, and he'll be discussing the most current research within the past few weeks that's come about. Ralph? Uh, thank you. Yeah, it seems like today most of our research is going to be primarily on vitamin D. In fact, most of our research is on vitamin D this week, it seems like. Vitamin D was recently studied in kidney patients and basically people are going through dialysis and such things like that. They discovered those with the best levels of vitamin D and actually taking vitamin D supplements had a 26% reduction in death. In addition, after two years, those taking the vitamin D supplements had a 20% reduction in need for dialysis itself. And basically, that was a wonderful finding for kidney patients. In addition, another article came out on vitamin D. And this dealt with people who are a little older, usually 65 plus. They discovered through the archives of general psychiatry on May 8th, the March is May 5th of this year, found that those with heavy depression, they had 19% lower vitamin D levels than those who did not. Now, I'm not saying people with lower vitamin D have heavy depression. It is those that have heavy depression all seem to correlate with low vitamin D levels. In addition, what they discovered, which was a little bit more disturbing, and those which are 65 or older, among men, 39% were clinically deficient in vitamin D. And ironically, among women, 57% were clinically deficient in vitamin D. And that was done with a study over 1,282 people. Now, for a little bit of a food warning. One of my workers' favorite foods is popcorn. Well, what would you do if you found out it wasn't too good, possibly even triggering an asthma in your kids or the lung disorders like emphysema? Well, there's a chemical in popcorn called diacetyl. It's a group of chemicals, I should say, that give popcorn its butter flavor. Well, a group of researchers in the issue of toxicology pathology basically were trying to sound the warnings on this chemical for quite some time. And the CDC has actually listed diacetyl, again, the chemical that gives popcorn its butter flavor, as an inhalation hazard. And you say, well, all right, I'll take that warning to heart. I just won't eat popcorn. They recently discovered even when you microwave popcorn in the workplace, there are high concentrations of this lung irritant found throughout the workplace itself. It's from the vapors they discovered, and they said, quote, it is the diacetyl, it's vapors itself that can injure the lungs, not the consumption. Which leads me to my next ironic article. All right, well, the warning on popcorn, butterfly popcorn came out, I think the 28th of April of this year, which led to the damage control of the 1st of May of this year. The National Cancer Institute came out with an article basically stating about how the U.S. population's diet is not exactly up to par. They said that 83% of Americans get their vegetables from white bread, starches, and potatoes, and ketchup. Only 10% consumed whole grains. Now here comes the ironic part, which I thought was kind of funny. Now remember, this study was presented by the National Institute of Health and also ConAgra, which is an agricultural company. Their answer was eat more popcorn. Which was interesting because as it came out in the study, it says people who eat popcorn have an approximately 250% higher daily intake of whole grains and a 22% higher daily intake of fiber than non-popcorn eaters. According to the Centers for, Human, Centers for Human Nutrition, researchers used data from 1999 to 2002. And they surveyed Americans basically throughout the country, all throughout areas. In addition to find out that only 10% of the Americans consumed even the recommended daily allowance of fiber. But, again, that was their main recommendation. Their answer, of course, after that article was that eat more popcorn, it'll save America. All right, now for the updates. I like to speak more about vitamins. I always do. And sometimes I have to bring a lot of information about medications in there that could be possibly hazardous. Even though I would love to be able to tell you more about that, my philosophy is when laying in the middle of the road, it is better to pull you out of the road before I start telling you the benefits of the sun. So, keeping that in mind, a lot of you heard the story about the incontinence drug out there and believing that it only affected people taking these medications that started developing what they call memory problems. Well, it wasn't just incontinence medications. 
It was blood pressure medications. It was antacids. It was asthma medications. All these drugs which tend to block a very important neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. The one chemical you may hear about that increasing the levels helps with the prevention of Alzheimer's. What they discovered was this. Just, basically just one years of use on these medications, uh, they, they discovered the decline would represent a resident, for example, in a nursing home, going from requiring only limited assistance in an activity to being completely dependent or from requiring only supervision to requiring extensive assistance in activity. That was one year's worth of use off of an antacid, off of a blood pressure medication, an incontinence medication, or asthma medication. That was it, not combined. But what they also discovered is that 40% of the participants of those people in the study were on at least more than one type of this medication. If anybody taking what this class of drugs called antichlorogenic medications, you may want to really consider the risk-benefit ratio, which leads to my other favorite subject, behavior modification through chemistry. It is definitely a brave new world. Many of you may have heard about the anti-smoking drug called Chantex. Basically what it does, they found out, is if you take the medication for a six month period of time, it reduces your propensity to smoke by 33%. Meaning that 33% of the people who are taking the medication were not smoking after six months. But it also had another interesting side effect. Psychosis. 43% of the individuals taking Chantex developed what they call psychiatric issues. Now, it should be fair. We can look at the positive side. That means 57% of the people who took the medication were okay. So it just depends on you want to see the glass half full or half empty. Now, the interesting part about this medication, it goes into a class of drugs which is used for, of course, behavior modification in regards to addictions, whether it be food or something else. Well, when one drug fails, what do you do? You change your market. Well, they're taking the medication and they're going to market it to children. Studies suggest caution on new anti-obesity drug in children. How do these drugs prevent addiction? They reduce your ability to feel pleasure. But also one interesting thing. So giving the drug to kids sounds interesting as far as reducing the pleasure in food. But it also stops the brain from developing itself. So keep that in mind. In the near future, you're probably going to find a lot of medical doctors or medical professionals want to recommend these new anti-obesity drugs to children. So fine, except one thing, outside the severe depression, chance of suicide, the brains won't develop. My answer to that is you take the board members of these, of these uh, companies and you make them do the trials on these drugs on themselves. Well, that's it. I'm done and thank you. Thank you very much for joining the uh, Fit and Healthy Today show. We hope this uh, show was both informative and will push you into looking to other alternatives to help you with fitness and research. Thank you.